Games are an amazing way of being able to illustrate and highlight sensitive issues, dark themes, and subjects of physical or mental health. Games are a brilliant creative outlet for us, and just like reading a story or watching a film, you get a full experience of understanding, a level of empathy for those characters in that story. Games in particular do this extremely well, as you are playing as that person, so you feel what they feel, and those emotions that they feel can often hit you hard. For me and a lot of others, indie games certainly blaze a trail for more games that focus on issues of mental health and other conditions that perhaps don't get talked about enough. The indie games boom of the mid 2010s was where we got to see titles such as Night in the Woods, Frambo, Gris, Sally Face, and Aspie Life. All these games tackled certain issues in their own way and part of the reason why I played and enjoyed these games was because you take away a deeper meaning from them. By stepping into the shoes of some of these amazing characters, you are able to gain a deeper understanding of the struggles and issues that particular protagonist is dealing with. For people who play these games and can relate to them, it makes the game that much more special to the player, with players also learning about that particular issue or condition, and thus having an awareness and something extra that they can take away after they put the controller down. Another example of this is 2016's RPG Maker horror game Pocket Mirror by developers Astral Shift, who were inspired to create their own game after seeing and playing the likes of Ebe and The Witch's House. Just a quick sidebar, they are currently working on a prequel to Pocket Mirror called Little Goody Two Shoes that focuses on the mother Elise and her story leading up to the events of Pocket Mirror, which is awesome and I can't wait for that. Now in Pocket Mirror, you play as a young girl who is on a journey in a strange world to try and find her true identity. And before I comment on why this is, and the lore side of things, I just have to talk about how this game stands out amongst a lot of the other RPG Maker games. And whilst it's made on the RPG Maker VX Ace engine, the game stands out visually amongst a lot of its peers in my opinion, due to the exceptional artwork and animation that goes into different areas and sequences of the game. And don't get me wrong, I freaking love the soundtrack too. If you watch my Let's Play, I say it in nearly every video how much I love that OST. The piano. Oh, it's brilliant. But the animation that goes into specifically the theatre sequences are just so well crafted and put together. When playing an RPG making game, you don't necessarily expect to see that, and it emphasises just how much love and attention to detail went into the game by its indie developers. It's no surprise that Astral Shift themselves state that their goal is to elevate their games into pieces of art through a rich sensorial experience, and that clearly comes across in Pocket Mirror, both visually and audibly. Don't get me wrong, you have your limited gameplay mechanics due to the engine, there are your generic RPG Maker Horror chase sequences, and it certainly could have benefited from a checkpoint system towards the end of the game, so that if you die you don't have to rewatch and albeit really cool looking but relatively long 5 minute cutscene each time. But RPG Maker games on the whole live and die through its narrative and its characters, and Pocket Mirror delivers in both of these aspects. It has a great cast of different characters, and as we'll come on to in the next section, a rich and compelling, if not initially confusing narrative. Just a quick one for the flow of this video, and due to the heavy amount of symbolism through each area, to best contextualise the symbolism through the characters and locations, we'll kind of be going backwards and discuss the endings and the revelations about the protagonist, whose name we later find out is Goldia, and this will allow us to gain a much better understanding of the rest of the game. Now we learn the most about Goldia, her family and other characters in the theatre sequences and the endings. We learn that Goldia has a largely dysfunctional family despite being wealthy. Her father was away much of the time at war, with the game set in the late 19th century in Austria. She also had a twin brother Henry, though little is known about him, and of course her mother Elise. Now as we see in the dawn ending, Goldia waking up in a psychiatric hospital we learn that she was diagnosed with lunacy, schizophrenia, and dissociative identity disorder. This, according to the devs, was a result of her dysfunctional family, her father away and distant, and a brother who didn't care for her. This led to her creating a number of multiple personalities as a coping mechanism for dealing with everything around her. Eventually, though, she fell into a coma, and this coma would last for seven to eight years, which is potentially everything we do in the game. 
and upon waking up at the end, she is 20 years of age. We'll go into more details as we discuss each of the other characters, but with this information in mind, it now provides a new perspective on a lot of the events in the game. The game begins with some dialogue from Goldia's mother, Elise. Hold your memories close to your heart. And this is confirmed to be Goldia's mother, Elise, and she follows up by saying, you shouldn't ever let it go. Do you understand? Goldia replying, yes, mother. Elise speaking with her daughter for what kind of feels like the last time, although we don't, we never know this for sure. It does kind of feel like this might be the last time that they have properly spoke to each other, perhaps before she fell into a coma. I'm not sure. Now playing the game for the first time, obviously it sounds like she's talking about the pocket mirror. That's the game's title. And you see throughout the game, multiple other characters trying to take her pocket mirror. And the important thing we need to work out is what does the pocket mirror represent? So with the endings that we see and the pieces of information about Goldia and their Dihilij family, we learn that Goldia's mother Elise chose to make a deal with a demon or what some of the characters called him in the game, the strange boy. In any case, Elise was a poor girl with barely any money to her name, found in the woods as a newborn baby. She is an ambitious and dreamy girl and in her early teens comes across a strange boy and this strange boy reveals what he can do for her, and being the naive girl that she is, asks for riches beyond her wildest dreams. But in exchange for these riches, the strange boy requests the identity of her firstborn girl. This is as much as we know so far about Elise. However, with the anticipated release of Little Goody Two Shoes, the prequel to Pocket Mirror, we are sure to find out more about Elise and the events that led her to meeting with the strange boy, which will be seriously fun, and I'm so looking forward to that. But going back to answer the question, what does the pocket mirror represent? It's the key that she needs to be able to remember who she is. And as confirmed by the developers, the pocket mirror is in fact real, and she does have it in the real world. So this is likely a gift that her mother gave her for one reason or another, perhaps through her mother's love, gives Goldia a chance at regaining her identity that Elise gave away in a deal with the strange boy. This is why the strange boy creates Angel to try and steal the pocket mirror throughout the game, as this would leave Goldia trapped without her identity known to her and in control of the strange boy, as the original deal intended. This also gives rise to the notion that the strange boy is real, as he met in the real world with Elise, but can also enter Dream, as we see in Pocket Mirror, as much to many YouTube commenters' dismay, the entirety of the game is played in Goldia's comatose state, or in a dream. Yes, it was all in her mind, it doesn't take away from the experience of the game. Moving on. As Eagle is, is kind of an extension of Fletter's personality, I'm going to skip a lot of, of Eagle as, as, a, as a character and a personality in herself. So, upon opening a chest in the early part of the game, we meet Fletter, the Lilliputian princess. Lilliputian meaning trivial, or very small. Throughout Goldia's time with Flair, you very soon realise how controlling, rude and manipulative she is, as she always has to win the games that you play and gets mad at Goldia for next to nothing. So where did this personality of Flair's come from? Well it can be argued that the Flair personality reflects Goldia at a very young age, copying her controlling mother Elise, spoilt with riches thanks to Elise's contract with the strange boy. In Fletter's theatre we see her picking up a letter that angers her greatly and she deems it as lies that have been written about her, going into heavy denial about this letter and then pinning the blame of these lies on another of Goldia's personalities, Lisette. And whilst we never find out exactly what is written on these letters, it is implied that Goldia, as Fletter, finds the letters that relate to the contract her mother made with the strange boy thus immediately blaming herself for the dysfunctional nature of her family. But this allows the personality of Fletter to come out more in denial about everything and just blame the lies of this contract as being made up by the scapegoat of the personalities, Lisette, who we will discuss shortly. Now in losing Fletter's game we get her bad ending, or dead endings uh, as, as they are called, and this one is called Porcelain, 
and I believe the bad in, in the game represent a situation in which one personality takes over Goldia entirely. Flair states, I am all you need, miss. And Goldia essentially becomes one of Fletter's dolls, losing control and never finding out who she is, choosing instead to stay and play with Egalette, and be a child forever. Now when getting each of the personalities good endings, it is a result of Goldia accepting them as part of her. Goldia is going through the game learning about each part of her that she created, and each part of her helped her to deal with one situation or problem in her home life which is why Fletter always calls her ungrateful for how much Fletter helped her, how much Fletter provided a friend through Egalette, a made up fantasy kingdom to play in, an escape. It isn't until Egalette, a smaller facet which has its own personality, stands up to Fletter, does Fletter decide to accept the situation and stop lying to herself. Fletter then gets upset at Goldia for forgetting her, when in reality it was due to the strange boy that Goldia forgot her. And after her tucking her in and reading a bedtime story, Goldia accepts Fletter as part of her. And she shatters in front of her. The shattering is of course representative of Goldia looking in a mirror and seeing Fletter as a reflection. That shattering means that Goldia has taken a step towards understanding herself and now Fletter no longer needs to be. As she is alive in Goldia, she is a part of her, now and for forever. The next section of the game revolves around another personality of Goldia's, that of Harpe, the maiden of pristine eyes. Harpe is a strong, prideful girl who has sworn an oath to protect Goldia from any type of harm. She is the quintessential mother figure of the personalities that Goldia has created, however can be extremely short-tempered when the protagonist chooses to disobey her requests. It is also confirmed that Harpe is indeed blind, as most of us would expect, it's why she gets scared exiting the elevator to a floor where she doesn't remember where everything is. It's why she is seen walking into various objects in one section of the secret manor. And it's why the tea that she gave Goldia when they first met didn't taste nice. Because it was mouldy, as confirmed by the developers. So she only poisoned us by accident. So that's fine. Uh, no! So why did Goldia create this strong protective personality in her mind? Well this one is slightly more straightforward than the others. Goldia, getting a bit older, perhaps at the age of 8 or 9, and her mental health worsening due to the horrible home life she was enduring, was losing hope that things would turn around. She wouldn't accept that she had any issues and wanted to pretend that everything was fine, that she was fine. And so appeared Harpe in her mind. Harpe who would protect her from harm, from the family and the world around her, and proceed to go about her days learning, improving herself, and trying to be the best version of herself that she could be. Unfortunately, as shown in Harpe's theatre, when Goldia took on the persona of Harpe, her family refused to accept this version of Goldia as their daughter or sister, likely due to how different she was from Goldia, regardless of if she was a better version of herself. And refusing to accept that the situation in which she lived in was terrible, a selfish brother, a distant father and an ill mother who could not be the mother figure that Goldia needed in her life to help her get better, this led to blindness. Blindness to her reality. Blindness to the horrors of the world in which she grew up in. Blind to the notion that she herself was ill and needed help. The symbolism of blindness is there for us to see, no pun intended. Goldia used Harpe so she wouldn't have to see the world as it was and instead could feel safe and secure. She only saw what she wanted to see. This explains Harpe's bad ending quite simply. As previously mentioned, I believe these are when one personality takes over Goldia entirely, and in this case, it's Goldia choosing to stay blind to the situation in her life, taking the easy option to ignore the real world problems that she has, and instead to stay this protective figure and carry out her duty. Harpe says it herself, You must give in, you must lose control, and never mind your fears. It's the fear that Goldia has of accepting the reality of her situation that leads to this ending and to her losing herself forever, trapped under the care of the maiden with pristine eyes. 
Now as this section of the game progresses, Harpe gets more and more upset with Goldia, as we choose to disobey her request that will, in Harpe's blind eyes, keep us out of harm's way. This eventually leads to this moment. And because we are consistently disobeying her, it is stopping Harpe from being able to carry out her duty, and she can't accept that. The entire reason for her creation was to protect Goldia and to keep her from harm. And now that Goldia is asking her to instead accept us as we are and to be friends, Harpe doesn't know how to feel. But the slap also represents the end of Harpe, as she is duty bound to keep her from harm, and now Harpe is the one leading her to harm. She can't carry on anymore. And Goldia choosing to accept Harpe for exactly who she is, flaws and faults and all, and of course for helping her understand herself, for helping her to stand up for herself, and this leads to Harpe shattering and her good ending. Goldia has once again taken a step further into figuring out who she is, and Harpe is again one more facet of who she is in her journey into discovering her identity. And now we come to Lisette, the Sleeping Maiden of Horrors, who we first saw in the infamous Mirror Maze sequence prior to meeting Harpe. Things don't start off well as we were quite literally being chased by her, but it isn't until we're captured by Lisette that we start to learn a bit more about her and how she wants to, in her words, shatter us. She wants the pocket mirror so she can shatter us and any hope of Goldie at remembering who she is. However, in the game, there is not just one Lisette, but many. And it isn't until her ending do we meet the real Lisette, as apparently Lisette rids impure feelings by casting them into the reflections within the mirrors. This is why much of Lisette's area are then hundreds and hundreds of mirrors everywhere, as well as a whole number of different Lisettes with different feelings and thoughts. Each one is a thought or feeling Lisette once had that she discarded into a mirror, so she wouldn't have to feel that way. So why does Lisette want to shatter Goldia? Why does she despise her so? Why does she not want to help Goldia remember who she is like Fletter and Harpe? Well, as Harpe mentioned, Lisette is ill. She is the epitome of rage, frustration and despair. And she is like this because this personality of Goldia's was born out of Goldia's mistakes, her frustrations, bad feelings and emotions. In the library during Harpe's section of the game, it talks of someone having nervous outbursts during tutoring sessions tearing pages out of books, scribbling over her own notes and throwing tantrums. She also did things such as ripping her own hair out during lectures and attempted to harm herself with the quill. So when certain emotions overtook Goldia, likely as a result of domestic violence, her ill mental health or other factors in her life, Lisette is the persona that Goldia would take on and it would be Lisette who would take all the blame for every wrongful action that Goldia ever showed. Lisette is the scapegoat for all of the wrongful actions that occurred even when Goldia portrayed other personalities like Fletter, and when Fletter was to be told off for doing something she shouldn't have, Fletter would just blame Lisette, and it was always Lisette's fault. Now how would you feel if you shouldered the blame for someone every time they did something wrong? It would certainly be too much to handle, wouldn't it? And for Lisette, it was. Her personality descended into madness, and after so much blame and guilt for actions that were not of her own doing, she snapped, and decided that she could no longer carry on taking this abuse. Which leads to these impure feelings being thrown into mirrors, and another version of Lisette is formed in Goldia's mind. They are all a small part of her, but none of the ones that we meet or speak to throughout are the real Lisette. She is fractured almost to the point of no return, and this mad version of Lisette now that Goldia is face to face with her, wants revenge. The revenge takes place in what can only be described as the best bad ending of the game and I'm so annoyed I didn't just choose the wrong option on purpose during my let's play as this would have been really cool to react with you guys and I should have just done it because I'm pretty sure I worked out what was the good ending and what was the bad ending. Anyway, in the Midnight Circus you are face to face with Lisette and you have a choice to make as Lisette gets her chance to shatter you and the pocket mirror. If Goldia chooses to protect herself from Lisette, she is choosing not to accept Lisette as part of her, 
and instead to be fearful of this personality that she has created, to protect herself and the others from Lisette, rather than trying to understand and accept her. And upon doing this, Lisette shatters the pocket mirror, shattering Goldia and Fletter and Arpe too, as well as herself and this world, forever leaving Goldia in this coma, never to wake up and understand who she is. In this action, in her madness, Lisette has actually done the strange boy's work for her. By destroying the pocket mirror, Lisette destroys the one thing that Goldia had to hold on to, to give her hope for discovering her identity. Now accepting Lisette leads to Lisette's true ending and an extremely emotional and poignant realisation from Goldia. She finally remembers all of the horrible things she did and how she used Lisette as a scapegoat so she wouldn't have to feel bad herself if anything she did was wrong. I will atone for my sins in your stead. All of them. This is such a powerful statement from Goldia. And of course, for Lisette, the real Lisette, she is finally able to be happy and at peace no longer being the one who was blamed for everything. Goldia is owning up to her mistakes and of course, thanking the set for being that shield that allowed Goldia to again deal with the issues in her life, whether rightly or wrongly. In this moment, she owns up to it and accepts Lisette as another part of herself. And like with the others, knowing that this time she won't forget what she had done for her and she shatters. Now those are the three main personalities that Goldia created herself to help deal with the problems she had in her life. However, as we know, there is one more personality that we meet throughout the game, and she is certainly quite different to the rest. Angel, a strikingly similar looking personality to Goldia, with black hair and golden eyes. We meet her numerous times through mirrors as she informs us that our name is Angel, same as hers, though we later find out that this is indeed not true. And we soon discover who Angel really is, as for one thing she is not a personality that was created by Goldia. As we discover when we see Angel's theatre, with a drop of gold, the strange boy creates a new persona within Goldia's mind, that of Angel. A persona created for a desire to be happy and a will to live a true life, but to do that she must take the pocket mirror. Only then can she also be free of this world and become a real girl. The strange boy had put the notion into Angel's mind that she had to take the pocket mirror and without it she couldn't live a real life and by doing this he would ensure that the pact Elise made with him is seen through and Goldia is to never know her true identity. Angel, his daughter as he calls her, is merely a tool by which he can retrieve the pocket mirror and stop her from waking up and remembering who she is. We then see all of the moments throughout the game of which Angel was either involved or just watching Going back to the start of the game where we see a golden finger on the floor which is that of Angels who broke the mirror to get through to the other side. She is watching everything Goldia does throughout the game and the strange boy is using this as motivation for Angel to take everything from Goldia. During Angel's section of the game the two discuss many things about the real world to which Angel is fascinated as she has no knowledge of it. Goldia is constantly asking her questions about who she is and Angel is of course bending the truth to try and coax the pocket mirror out of her. What I find interesting about this section, specifically the section where the strange boy enlists a horrific version of Angel to chase them, is why would he do this? He created Angel to take the pocket mirror, so it surprises me that he is messing with Angel and moving the world around to confuse and almost try and enlighten Goldia as to the true nature of Angel. As Angel says herself, he's provoking us, and she gets enraged by this. As well as this, the strange boy is the one that showed Goldia Angel's theatre. He showed her the truth. But why? That would obviously stop Goldia from trusting Angel and of course, never let her have the pocket mirror. That aside, as we get to the finale of the game, the two face off after both transforming into their final forms. But seriously, Goldia decides then that she wants to accept Angel as part of her as well. She wants to remember her, and she wants to have her as much a part of herself as Fletter, Harpe and Lisette. As Goldia is accepting of her, this triggers a transformation which I believe is symbolic of her coming full circle 
with her acceptance and understanding of who she truly is and can now wake up but she wants Angel to come with her. Angel however rejects the offer and instead doubles down on her desperation to take the pocket mirror and become a real girl herself. And after a very difficult and dramatic chase scene the pocket mirror floats beyond the both of them and a chase for the pocket mirror is on. If Angel picks it up she thinks she has succeeded and can escape and wake up in the real world as the strange boy had suggested however what happens instead is that Angel shatters and she quickly works out that the strange boy had set her up there was never a chance that Angel could escape with the pocket mirror but keeping it from Goldia was the objective and as we see it return to her perhaps the strange boy accepted that the pocket mirror and the sacrifice that Goldia's mother Elise made to give her daughter a chance to regain her memories and identity is perhaps too powerful for even him to take from her it's also confirmed by the devs that Angel shattered upon touching the pocket mirror because the protection that it has provided Goldia from the strange boy also included anything that he created. This of course included Angel. Now we get to the endings and I must admit I made a mistake in my let's play as I was convinced that certain endings were true and others weren't. However Astral Shift confirmed that there isn't one true ending and with that in mind we will just explain and break down each one here. Starting with the Dawn ending that occurs when we let Angel take the pocket mirror and we have three regalias. We see a slightly older 20 year old Goldia wake up in a room with some notes about her dissociative disorder as well as a large golden mirror in the corner. We then see her open the curtains with light shining through, symbolizing that she has indeed regained her memories. And according to the devs, as long as she holds onto the pocket mirror, she would live a happy life. So that means that the importance of the pocket mirror is as much in Goldia's dream in her comatose state as it is in the real world. Now if we retain the pocket mirror, we discover Angel's regalia, a scythe, which is symbolic of her role in the game and her true intentions to essentially kill Goldia and take her place in the real world. Angel then shatters again, only this time we take her regalia and the gate opens and we see Elise in a small cottage sweeping outside. With a very young Goldia running around finding a pair of red shoes inspired of course by the Wizard of Oz. This ending, the little goody two shoes ending, is in fact a scenario that shows what Goldia and Elise's life would have been like had Elise not decided to make her deal with the strange boy. Certainly something a lot more happier. The ending you receive when you do not obtain all three of the regalias will lead to this. What appears to be a decision Goldia makes to stay in this comatose state with her other personalities because she does not truly find out who she is. She instead recreates herself in the form of Platinum, a being of ignorant joy who accepts that she will never discover who she truly is and instead choosing to become something else entirely. She understands that each of Fletter, Harpe and Lisette are reflections of herself, but she is missing the key part, Goldia. And the reason this is, is because of the regalias. Each of the regalias has a letter. Each one, when put together, spells out the name Goldia. And without all of them, she cannot truly understand who she is. And the last ending, when Goldia has failed to achieve any regalias, leads to the witching hour, in which the strange boy puts on his final theater for Goldia her theatre. It proceeds to show Goldia each of her personalities, why they first appeared and punishing them right in front of her. Fletter as she needed a friend, Lisette as she needed a scapegoat and Harpe as she needed protection and Angel as someone she wanted to accept. 
but with Goldia not ever understanding what each of them really were to her, she failed in her chance to discover who she was. The strange boy succeeded in taking the pocket mirror, and so Goldia would remain in a comatose state, never knowing who she truly is. The pact that her mother Elise made with the demon was seen through, and a quite horrible ending for the protagonist of this great RPG maker horror game comes to fruition. Each of the endings of Pocket Mirror is just one scenario that could play out, with there being no true ending as such. As we know, this game uses a heavy amount of symbolism throughout, and hides a lot of clues to the story in plain sight throughout the game, such as the letters of the Regalias. Its brilliant storytelling and contrasting characters makes the game shine, and with its artistic theatre sections and brilliant soundtrack helping the game really stand out. And I could go on about how much I enjoy this game and how good I think it is, but I want to go back to the start of the video for a minute. Because when you play the game for the first time, and that realisation hits you that each of Fletcher, Harpe and Lisette are creations of Goldia in her mind, it really changes your perspective of the story whilst you play it. The deal with the strange boy aside, Goldia had to deal with real life issues in her childhood, which resulted in issues with her mental health, that many people in real life experience. And that's what I meant when I say that you take something extra away from games that have this deeper meaning to them. And yes, whilst a lot of people may not like the fact that the game happened in Goldia's comatose dream state, arguing that it makes the entire playthrough meaningless, I think, far from it. Goldia, having gone through all of the trauma, violence and neglect that was her childhood, which led to her dissociative disorder and insanity diagnosis. She was able to come through all of it, through the journey in her mind, and regain the memories that she had lost as a result of the deal her mother made. The Dawn ending, I like to think, is Goldia's true ending, as it shows hope for Goldia to live a happy rest of her life. Despite the issues she has, whether that was a result of her childhood, or a result of the strange boy and a deal with Elise, she has learned more about herself and can now move forward with Fletter, Harpe, Lisette, and Angel as part of her. Goldia no longer has to look back. Now, as I often do with these videos, I will say if you haven't played the game and experienced it yourself, go and download it from Game Jolt, if for no other reason than the fact that it is free. And moving forward, we get to check out the highly anticipated prequel, Little Goody Two Shoes, that focuses on Goldia's mother, Elise, where we get to experience the events that led Elise to making that fateful deal with the strange boy. I want to thank you guys for again watching another one of these discussion videos and for anyone that watches through to the end I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed doing them. They definitely take a lot more time than the let's play videos but I hope you do enjoy it anyway. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did like this video hit that like button for me guys because it really really does help me out. If you have any other games that you think would fit this kind of video essay style, this discussion theory video style let me know. And, uh, and we can look into it. If you are new here, do feel free to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and check out some of the other videos I've got going on. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video.